Hello and welcome to today's program, Stories from Friends. Today is the third part in a four part series. Didn't catch parts one and two? No worries. You don't need to have heard the other parts to enjoy tonight's program. But if you do want to listen back, I will post links in the chat box. Join us on May 17th for our final storyteller, Cheryl Mason. That link will also be in the chat box. Tonight's storyteller is Ruth Walkup. Ruth Walkup is a cultural anthropologist, a former diplomat, a university professor, and a coach for executive leaders. In her work and her play, stories are the way to mark, remember, teach, celebrate, and explain. Ruth tells waypoint stories. Waypoints are intermediate places along the route of a journey or a point at which the course of travel changes. Ruth's travels, both literal and otherwise, have brought her into contact with amazing people, noteworthy places, and memorable experiences. This evening, Ruth's Waypoint Stories will navigate us to attentiveness and insights of the world around us through her true personal experiences. And just a quick programming note, tonight's presentation will be broken up into several shorter stories. So if you have questions about a story that's being told, feel free to throw those questions into the chat box or the Q&A box. There will be opportunities for audience questions after each story. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ruth Walker. I went to school barefoot through a hole in the east fence of our yard. At least I think it was the east fence because I remember the sun setting on the other side of the house through the rainforest where the big ports hugged the house. Through the fence was the most direct route to Bulape School. It was a double row of buildings with tin roofs. The school was part of a Presbyterian mission station in the country Zaire, it's now called the Congo. The station included a hospital, a church, five missionary houses, we lived in one of them, and the school. My parents were missionaries for 40 years, and this was one of their first postings. Every morning before classes started, we gathered around a flagpole in the center of the two rows of buildings, and we stood by classes, stock still in the early morning equatorial air, as the, some high schoolers raised the flag. And the flag was a black fist holding a torch with a red flame against a green field. Zaïrwa dans la paix retrouvée. Peuple uni, nous sommes Zaïrwa. En avant, fier et plein de dignité. Peuple grand, peuple libre à jamais. The Zairean national anthem brought to men, vi men in visored caps and high boots. But at Bulapé School, that wasn't what was there. It wasn't precise. It wasn't neat. In fact, it was 236 Black children in tattered clothes with no shoes and me in my smocked dresses with rickrack that my grandmother in Missouri made and no shoes. Thank goodness my parents didn't make me wear any. After the national anthem, we went by our classes into, um, we, started, we started dancing around the flagpole and we danced praising the president and the, and the country that we lived in. Mobutu se 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 go, gugung bendo, azambanga, oye which translates to the all-powerful warrior who, because of his endurance and infallible will to win, goes from conquest to conquest, leaving fire in his wake or something like that. And then we would shuffle into our classrooms and put five tiny bodies into desks that were made for only three. The blackboard was dark paint on the wall. At Bulapay School, we didn't have school when it rained. 
because the tin roofs made it so that we couldn't hear anyone except maybe the kid next to us. And if the wind was blowing and blew the wind in or blew the rain inside, we had to close these very big ha black heavy shutters. And so we couldn't see because there was no electricity either. Our teacher was a narrow hipped young man who probably never went past the eighth grade. He wrote our sums and sentences with little crumbs of chalk on that blackboard, working around the crevices in the wall. In the second grade, French was a, the foreign language taught and all of instruction was in Chaluba. In the fourth grade, everything was taught in French. But by then, most of the girls had dropped out and the boys were thinning out too. They were being called to stay at home and help with younger siblings or preparing and harvesting in the fields, cooking and cleaning. Our teacher only had a few books and we students had none. Most of the time we learned by repetition and wrote trois fois trois fait neuf, trois fois quatre fait douze, the multiplication tables, the names of the countries surrounding Zaire, French regular verbs, French irregular verbs. And sometimes we copied what he wrote onto small slates with lead pencils that erased easily enough with a little bit of spit and a rub of the side of the hand. Sometimes the thin teacher used imagination and stories. He would take us beyond the walls of the little Bulapé school. Sometimes he would ask us to think about sitting with Mobutu, the president whose picture hung in every single classroom in the entire country with his leopard skin hat and his big heavy black rimmed spectacles. Our teacher sometimes whisked us through the geography of Africa and the peoples of Africa, the Maasai warriors far to the east with cows. We didn't have cows where we were. And the Zulus fierce were far to the south and the pygmies who lived in our own country in the Northwest. We imagined that we were Egyptian slaves under the hot sun and whips building the pyramids. And he helped us imagine the movements of the animals as they went through the forest. And he did it with beating the, the desks with different rhythms of drum beats. Over the four years that I attended Bulapay School, after school let out, which was about one o'clock in the afternoon, I ran back through the hole in the fence, back home to a lunch of rice and greens, and hot sauce and maybe a slice of mango pie. And after a nap, I went to a special room that was off the garage, a room that we called American School. And American School was designed to make sure that I didn't fall behind American students when I was in Africa. American School was taught by Mrs. Brown. And Mrs. Brown, had encyclopedias and books. She had a PhD from Harvard. And Mrs. Brown was called that for two hours in the afternoon, otherwise she was known as my mother. American school was where I learned new math, English language arts, how to look things up in those encyclopedias. I learned about Virginia geography and Virginia Indians. And at American school, we always went to school when it rained. Not too long ago, I realized that I still have a hole in the east fence of my mind. I work and study on the American school side with facts and figures, with encyclopedias and logic. But when I want to, sometimes I go through that hole 
in the fence back to the Bulape side, where I could be a character that marches through history, where I can be one of those animals in the forest, where I can imagine with poetry and stories. And sometimes I like the Bulape side better. And there is a picture of me with my second grade class in Bulape School. Thanks, Hannah. So I uh, just want to remind the audience that because tonight is broken up into different stories, there is an opportunity after each story to ask a question. Um, I have a question for you, Ruth, um, but uh, while I'm asking it, I just want the audience to remember they can put questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. So my question for you is that I can really see how the craft of storytelling has, has been a big part of your life. Um, can I ask, how do you use storytelling outside of performance? That's a good question. Um, I, I tell, I teach with stories a lot. I use them as anecdotes. And sometimes the story may, may be just a, a minute long or even less, um, but their stories are really effective in teaching. Um, stories are effective in advocacy. And right now I'm working with a group outside of Richmond um, that is an advocacy group, an environmental advocacy group. And so I've been asked to come in to help them um, think about how they want to speak better and tell their stories about what might destroy their community if, if this particular project goes forward. Um, and I also teach how other people, leaders, how to tell stories, both just how to tell stories to be effective, but also how to tell stories with data, for example. How can you bring that data to life? Um, do you think your time in uh in the Congolese school influenced your storytelling at all? I would like to think so. I would like to think so. I wasn't focused on stories when I was that young, except my father used to make them up. And that's how I went to bed with stories from him. Um, but I, obviously I heard stories a lot. It was just when I became an adult and much later that I started to think about Hmm, what's the what's the different value that that I can place, and what does what do stories have? As an anthropologist, stories are are the currency that we anthropologists use, and so I'm familiar with stories, but I just hadn't thought about using them much myself. You call these stories waypoints. What is a waypoint, and how do they relate to your stories? Waypoints are think I want you to go back in history, time before um, before GPS. And we used to tell each other, and we did this in the Congo, um, how to get someplace by using landmarks. Turn left at the big tree at the intersection. And when you cross the stream, that kind of thing. So the intersection, the tree and the, and the stream were all waypoints. They're ways of knowing where we were along the journey. Nowadays, um, airline pilots actually use waypoints. There is nothing up there in the sky. It's a GPS place in space. Um, so I, I wanted to just sort of have a way of, for myself and those people listening to get a sense of the stories that I'm telling are places, people, experiences that are of interest to me, of note to me, that have some place in my memory. And so I came up with the idea of waypoints. It's been, been in the back of my head for, for a while. Um, how I can use this idea. And so you all are, are getting to, to see the benefits of that with a whole collection of very different stories. So. I think this waypoint in your Congolese school really resonated with some people in our audience. Joel writes, um, great rendition of La Hymne Nationale. Um, what a great photo. And Holly writes, just a quick comment. Thank you so much for describing my first through third grades so vividly lots of memories. Uh, we have one more question from Lynn before we move on to our next story. Uh, the story of the schooling experience from the Congo sounds similar to the differences in available resources in the US schools with students who are predominantly white or people of color. 
Have you made any observations about these similarities between a developed and a developing country? I have not um, spent a lot of time in elementary through, through high school in the United States. That was not a, an experience, a privilege that I had too much of. Um, and so personal experience, not a whole lot of, of understanding that. I do um, remember though, when I first came back to the US after my time in Bulape, and I had been spending it in, in Bulape school, and I came back to a school in, um, in Norfolk, Virginia, and the students had all been told that a student from Africa was going to join the mid-year. And I showed up, white, blue eyes, blonde hair, and they didn't know what to do with me. I mean, they, nobody knew who I should be friends with or whether they should be friends with me or who I should play jump rope with. And I talked funny languages and I didn't know the references that they were using. And so it was a bit of a mishmash and a, and a challenging time for a lot of us. Um, so if, if I can help people understand that what happens overseas and in other countries um, can be useful in this country, like storytelling, if you don't have the books, um, then I would, I, that, that is one of sort of my passions is how to, how to be a, a fertilizer for, for information going both ways. All right, that was our last question for this story. So I'll let you move on. Thanks. Whenever Roy Grings showed up at our house, it was at mealtime and he brought his own spoon. We never knew when he would arrive and we never knew when he would leave, but we could be sure that it would start with a meal and he would come alone and he would bring his spoon. Sometimes he would stay for a few days or a few months. Sometimes he would just disappear after the meal. However long he stayed, I knew that he didn't stay in the guest bedroom, but I don't know where he did sleep. He would just disappear. And then some other time he would show up, maybe in a different city at our house at mealtime. We always called him by his full name, Roy Grings. And we made it sound like one word, Roy Grings, not Mr. Grings or Uncle Roy, like I call some of the other missionary men. It was just Roy Grings. He was old. He was very old. He had very rough and wrinkled skin. His hair was white. And he parted his hair from the, from the very front all the way to the back. And he braided his long, white, wiry hair, and he braided it into his, his sideburns and then into a single braid down his chest. It was magnificent. His eyes were blue, crystal clear blue. And he always dressed in clean clothes, although they were threadbare old leather shoes, pressed trousers, an old belt holding them up, and an Oxford shirt buttoned all the way up to his Adam's apple and hidden by his braided beard. And he always carried that spoon bowl side up in his breast pocket. Roy Grings was born in the Congo in 1922. His parents were missionaries just like mine. He spent most of his growing up years there with his siblings, just like I did. He would, well, as far as I could tell, he had never really spent time, at least I never heard of him spending time in the US, but I know he must have because he spoke really good American English and he was relatively educated. He didn't fit, in my mind, in the US. He fit in Bulape. He fit in Kananga. He fit in Kinshasa. Congo River water flowed in Roy Grings' veins. And the red dirt of Africa was always under his fingernails, as well as a little bit of axle grease. 
the start of a Roy Griggs visit, like I said, always started with a meal and Roy Griggs could eat. He would eat thirds and fourths of whatever was being served, rice and beans or casserole, and certainly of the mango pie. He always ate with his own spoon. He rarely complimented the meal, but he never complained. And he's always asked for more. Papa usually invited him to say grace. And Roy Grings, I guess, thought that the Lord could hear him better if we all knelt down at the table and my sister and I learned to take our napkins with us because Roy Grings had a lot to say to the Lord. One way that Roy Grings served as a missionary was to translate. He translated the Bible. He wasn't a trained translator. He had picked it up somewhere. But he knew Latin and he knew Greek and he read his Bible through in both of those languages multiple times every year. And when he found a language in the Congo that, that didn't have a written Bible, he would take it and translate it himself. He would type on an old Smith Corona typewriter. And he told me one time that he had to stand as he typed because his breath was warm and comforting. And when he breathed, he would have to breathe in his same breath and he would get kind of sleepy. So in order not to sleep, he stood up. Another way that Roy Grings served was by fixing things. Roy Grings could fix anything. He fixed the x-ray machine at the hospital. He fixed the generator that ran for about three hours every night to give us electricity. He sharpened the kitchen knives. He fixed my mother's little tiny organ about the size of a radiator that along with the encyclopedias she brought in the 55 gallon barrels when we came to Bulape. The humidity and, and heat of the tropics were not doing a good job on this particular little organ. But every time Roy Grings came, he would fix it and he could play the organ too. He also fixed my sister's bike. He took the training wheels off and made it stop squeaking. So I couldn't call her a little Miss Squeaky bike like I like to call her. See, he was a magician with bicycles. That's how Roy Grings got around the Congo. Now the Congo is a country as big as the United States east of the Mississippi. And he rode it all on his bicycle. And one of the neat things is Roy Grings always answered my questions. And he taught me how to do things like fix my bicycle. He was someone who showed up regularly in my life when I was a kid. He was, he was one of those odd adults but magical and mysterious. He would come and go, appear and disappear, fix things. And he had that hair that he braided down and the spoon he always carried in his pocket. In the late 1990s, Roy Grings rode his bicycle into a missionary hospital and collapsed, probably from hunger or exhaustion or maybe just old age. And he was cared for by the Congolese nurses and they, they nursed him to health. And then one time they found him asleep under his bed and they, they radioed an emergency radio message to his niece who lived a couple hundred kilometers away. And they said, you must come quickly. Your uncle Roy Grings is dying as evidenced by his unwillingness to sleep in the bed. And she radioed back, if my uncle Roy is sleeping under the bed, he's doing fine. That's what he's always done. And a few days later, Roy Grings got up, got on his bicycle, put a spoon in his pocket, and rode away. 
Roy Grings died in 2006 in a hospital bed in the Congo. Thank you for that story. Um, someone else in the audience must know, know Roy Grings because I'm told he's a legend and fodder for many amazing stories. Um, Nancy and Evelyn sent in a question. Um, Nancy and Evelyn would like to know, when you start to craft a story, what do you tend to think of first? A person, place, or event? The beginning, middle, or end? Or does it just depend on the story? Please give us some insight into your process. That Everybody has a different process. And so my process is, I'll show you, I keep right on my desk a bunch of cards. These are half of, a, um, of an index card. And I just write down anything that comes to mind as a memory. Sometimes it happened today or yesterday. Sometimes it's from way, 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 way back. And I put them in a box. And when I'm then deciding that I need to, um, to develop a new story, I go through that box. And sometimes I, I sort them by these are events and there are, these are, these are um, stories about clothing maybe. Um, and so I, I, it happens in different, different ways about what I'm gonna tell about. Sometimes I'm given a, um, a theme if I'm in a story show with someone else and the theme might be, in fact, I did a, I did a storytelling event a couple of weeks, a month ago, I guess, called Stories I Can't Tell My Mother. And by the way, I think my mother's online and no mom, I am not going to tell you what I told you then or anybody else's story. Um, so that, that was a theme that, that, um, that I could, could tell about. Um, so that, that sometimes helps. Sometimes I also have, a, have something that's just niggling in my mind. Um, and I just, I need to figure out what, what it is about that memory that triggers it. And a story can be, can, you can focus on the, on the, before something happens, you can focus on the problem and you could, or you could focus on the end of the story. It just, it, for me, it really depends. Um, but there really is a, a an arc of a story. Um, and so I, it depends on what it is that, that sort of comes up quickly out of my, out of my, um, memory in my in my craft uh, we have a question from Jean about Roy uh, do you ever think you would become like Roy because your parents were also missionaries how much did you relate to Roy oh isn't that a uh, I don't know whether that's a good thing to think about or a funny thing to think about <laughs> Um, I do not mind being magical. I do not mind helping people. I do not mind being passionate. I do not mind disappearing and appearing when it, when it serves me. Um, so in that kind of way, um, I certainly hope I'm like Roy. Oh, so, yeah. Do you think your, um, how much you related to him changed from when you were a girl to as you grew into an adult? Well, I have to say that it changed in working on this story. Um, I started off this story thinking that he was just a quirky guy. And then I realized that I liked that quirkiness. And I, I, I wanted to show a little bit more of how much I respected him and how much I, even if he was quirky or maybe because he was quirky, um, but that, um, that there was a connection there. And I really do feel it. And I feel it more now having worked through the memories that I have of him. And that's one of the joys of storytelling is your story and your experience with the story changes as you tell it or as you work on it. All right, thank you. That was all of our questions for the Roy story. So we're gonna switch countries a little bit. We're gonna switch um, continents. A few years ago, I was living in New Delhi, India. I was there for a few months working at the U.S. Embassy. And I, during that time, I lived in a really fancy hotel. I ate in the hotel. I swam in the hotel pool. I ate or I, um, I worked out in the hotel gym. They did my laundry. That didn't happen at home. And it was, it was, I bought souvenirs in their shops. It was just a very fancy place. I mean, every morning when I came down to breakfast before I went to the, to the embassy, they would serve me a pot of green tea without me ever asking. Why? Because the first few days that I was there, I had ordered a pot of green tea. 
And from then on, it appeared before I even sat down. At the embassy, I had terrific colleagues, people that I worked with that I could collaborate with. It was wonderful, but I was the boss. And my staff held me at a little bit of a distance and said, yes, ma'am. And some evenings when I thought I might be able to do things sort of fun, I had official events and had to get dressed up and, and represent the American government. But all of this was a little stifling. I wanted to relax a little bit. I wanted to see how the normal people live. I wanted to be a little bit more normal than living in the fancy hotel. I wanted a little more homey and less sterile. So I asked my staff to invite me. And Darshna, the administrative assistant, invited me to her child's seventh birthday party at a restaurant where her husband was the chef. And it was wonderful and tasty. And I sat at the head of the table, not the birthday girl. Darshna also later took me to a market, her favorite outdoor market, and helped me pick out a couple of new scarves. Neeraj, the office driver, invited me to his house one Sunday. And his house was, was three rooms and a balcony just on, at the edge of one of the big slums of New Delhi. He lived there with his wife, his two children, and his mother in those three rooms. And when I came, they set me in a place of honor on the one chair they had. And they served me pudding, yogurt pudding with pomegranate seeds and pistachios on top. And they sat there silently while I ate the whole thing. I really appreciated these invitations. I really did. But my favorite invitation was to Loveline's house on a Sunday afternoon to celebrate Holi, H-O-L-I. Now, Holi has a couple of different um, translations in English. It's the festival of spring. It's a festival of colors. It's a time where family gets together and there's lots of love and laughter after a night of bonfires in which you are supposed to burn off the internal evils. Lovely was nearing retirement and said that she normally celebrated Holi with her daughter and her, and her son-in-law and their baby and her brothers and their wives and the nephews and the nieces. And would I like to come? Yes, please. So that morning I got into one of the black taxis at the fancy hotel. And I called Loveline and I handed the phone to the driver and he and Loveline talked and this, he, she told him where to go. And then I settled back for the 40 minute drive to her house. New Delhi is a big city. It was early April and starting to get hot, really hot. So I had dressed coolly, but modestly. The streets were mostly deserted because that previous night, people had attended those bonfires to burn their internal evils away. At one point, a, a motorcycle with two passengers, two passengers and the driver came by and one of the passengers shot a water gun at my taxi window with bright blue water. Well, we got to Loveline's house and I worked a little bit with Loveline's help to tell the taxi driver when he should return to pick me up and take me back to the fancy hotel. And Loveline took me and ushered me into her, her backyard. And there I was met with colors. Loveline's older brother came to me and took a handful of colored powder and smeared it all over me and gave me a big grin. He had green smudges on his forehead. And a cousin came up and gave me a big hug and put yellow all over me. And that was just the beginning. So for, for an hour, 
I threw malachite green powder on anybody who came by and I ran after the kids and put it in their hair and they did it to me. And we sm smeared each other with powder and we, we dusted each other with powder and we squirted each other with colored water and it was chaos. The malachite green was one of my favorite colors and it, it, um, it ended up everywhere. But so did all the other colors. And what was interesting is that we would throw this color and, and douse each other with color. And then we would stop and we'd go have some treats, some sweets, the special holy sweets or, or dumplings, sweet dumplings with, um, with dried fruit in them or, or a milk a cold milk that with sugar and almonds and rose petals and cardamom and a little black pepper. The entire afternoon was wonderful. Just a crazy free for all with all of these colors and water and kids running around and uncles uh, gently dousing people. And I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to resist, even though I was supposed to run away I was so, I wanted to get more colored because I liked playing holy. That's what they called it, playing holy. I liked the tenderness of the anointing with colors by the elders. I liked the color tag that I played with the children. I liked being able to erase the line between foreigner and boss and stranger and become friend and family and included. Later that afternoon, the taxi driver picked me up and we drove the 40 minutes back to the fancy hotel on the other side of town. And I got out of the car with my box of leftover sweets and the security guards saluted me as they always did, but this time with a little grin. And I walked into the marbled lobby and I was the most colorful thing around. There was the modern black furniture and the white marbled floors and the mirrored walls. And I caught myself of reflection in one of those mirrors and I was covered with colored powder. My hair, my face, my clothes, even my shoes. I, every step I took, poofed colors. And the hotel manager started to come towards me. Now he was always so formal, so respectful, so well-dressed. I just really was not looking forward to this particular encounter on this day. And he reached me quickly with his long, elegant strides in his three-piece suit. And he gave me the namaste. And he said with a twinkle in his eye that I had never seen before. So Dr. Walkup, you like to play holy? Yes, Mr. Nayan, I like it very much. We had one person in the audience say, I hope there's a picture of this. So ask <laughs> and ye shall receive. <laughs> So yeah, there's, I just had so much fun that day. No. Um, Mary has a question about holy and the colors that were used. Um, is there a certain significance associated with the different colors or why is color even used at all? It's about springtime. It's about the, the generation of new life and, and the flowers and things like that. Um, there, there are, I don't think there's any specific um, color association, um, at least I didn't hear of one. There was a lot of talk about the environmental um, impact that these colors might have because by the next morning, they're, the colors are running in the street. You see the colors all over my face were then running in the streets. Um, everything, the plants had colors all over them. And so um, there's, there's some, discussion about going back to the colors that were were um, made from from plants and and uh, bark and, and things like that um so i don't know about the actual i mean 
Hinduism has a lot of color association, but I didn't hear it with this particular um, event. Uh, I'm going to leave these these uh, pictures up while I ask the next question, since they're all about holy. Um, Lynn asks, have you ever attended a holy festival in the United States? I have not. I have not. I hope you have. Um, Kathy uh, writes, um, you know, this might be a spoiler for an upcoming story. Uh, her question is, Ruth, I was happy to hear you recounting your safari guide stretch um, and hippos who do not see blue. Do you have a story about stretch for us tonight? Well, Kathy, let's start right there. Hippos cannot see the color blue. Why would they need to? They don't need blue. They need grays and tans and browns, but they don't need blue. Grays and tans and browns are the colors of their food, of enemies, and frankly, of each other. And so they don't need blue. It's uninteresting and unimportant for them. They can't see it. Now, I learned that hippos can't see the color blue from my favorite safari guide, Stretch. Now, Stretch was called Stretch. Actually, I think his name was Andrew, but I never heard anybody call him that. Stretch was about 12 feet tall. We called him Stretch. Stretch was born a white Rhodesian, and he was now a white Zimbabwean. He had fought in the Civil War, and he had, at the top of his 12 feet, he had a red bushy beard and red bushy hair. Most of the time, Stretch was in his safari outfit, an olive gray pants, olive gray uh, shirt with the name of his safari camp on it, Goliath Safaris. <clears throat> and Stretch one time, the first time I got there, showed me a Goliath heron. It's an olive brown gray bird very tall with a tuft of red, kind of the avian version of Stretch. Stretch was legendary. Stretch had virtually magical powers. He could see lions at two miles away. He could see the changes in the dead grass that told him exactly when the rains would come six months down the road and exactly what time. He could practically peer into the ground and tell you where the mongoose were had their war in. Stretch was known throughout Southern Africa, anywhere I went, in South Africa, in Mozambique, in Namibia, in, um, in Zambia, they'd all heard of Stretch. He had been working for about 25 years in this one, um, national park, Monopools National Park, which is a UNESCO historical uh, or UNESCO historical site, cultural site. And he knew all of the elephants in that park by name. He named them. He named them um, JD, JD for juvenile delinquent because JD was a very naughty teenage elephant. There was Slotty who had a big slot in his ear and Oliver, Stretch knew them all. We went to Monopool, when we went to Monopools, we sort of drove from the city of Harare in the center of the country, sort of center of the country. And we drove for about four or five hours um, to, to the edge of the plateau where Harare was, was located. And then for the next hour, we descended into the Zambezi River Valley and the, the the um, vegetation changed completely. Up top, it had been scrub brush. And down in the valley were dry riverbeds and lots of baobab trees. Stretch was always at his camp, which was just along the Zambezi River. He was always in his camp when he arrived. And he would yell, Rufy! And he'd pick me up and swing me around so high that I probably needed permission for a landing if he, when he put me down. Now, Stretch is only one of four people in my life that I allow 
to call me Rufy. There's my grandma Evans, who made me dresses with Rick Rack. My grandpa Evans, my dentist, because I couldn't tell him not to, and Stretch. Stretch's luxury camp was a temporary camp right there on the banks of the Zambezi River. And it, temporary in that it went up in April and came down in October, November. And the rest of the year, there was no evidence of it. The animals kept coming through. In fact, they kept they coming through when the camp was open. It was, it was on the riverbank and there were a couple of different pieces of it. There was the staff quarters. There was, um, there was the staff quarters, there was the, uh, the cooking area, the dining area, and then eight tents along the, the river themselves. And the tents had two cots for each person. The ba bath and toilet areas were through the tents to the other side in an enclosed but open to the sky area where there was a flush toilet how did they do that they removed it every year um flush toilet and they had a shower that was heated by a fire on the outside of the tent and they pumped water up it was amazing so one day what was great after safari i loved coming back and and going into that shower and looking up at the full moon and the cool air, because it was usually the winter, and get the dust off. Actually, better yet, stretch. I'm going to stop real quickly. Hannah, can you hear me now? You, yeah, you're back. You, you came back before you even realized you were gone. OK, good. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to what was best was that, that stretch and, and if I didn't take a, sh a shower, stretch would have the, the staff heat water on the cook stove and then pour that water into a clawfoot bathtub that was placed right on the edge of the river. And it was sort of set off by some reed mats. And I could sit there with my glass of wine and watch the sunset over the Zambezi River. It was the bathtub with the best view in the whole wide world. Now the camp was on these paths of animals, various different animals, and they'd come through and they'd eat and they'd drink and they'd go to the water and they'd sometimes they would stay in the water for a long period of time. I mean, lions and hippos and, and leopards even, warthogs, elephants, all came through. There was one hippo who was a frequent passerby that was on her hippo highway. Her name was Bruce. Now, Bruce was named Bruce by a visitor who didn't know how to tell the difference between a male hippo and a female hippo. Anyway, by the time Stretch tried to correct this, the, the name stuck. So we all called her Bruce. So Bruce spent many days in the water right in front of camp. It was great to watch, watch her. And at night, she would get up like hippos do and, and go off and, and go eat. And you never wanted to get between the water where a hippo feels safe and where the hippo is if she's out of the water. And sometimes there were times where I had to stay in the clawfoot tub with my empty glass of wine as Bruce came through the camp. Sometimes she just sat down and stayed. So the way safaris worked was like this. Usually this, we got up very early in the morning. It was cold. We had some milk tea and some biscotti. And then we would pile into the, um, the Land Rover which was the, the stretch had a couple of them, but, but this particular one that I liked was, was a stadium that had stadium seating with three different rows and you could fit four or five people into each row. And we'd cover ourselves with wool blankets. Like I said, winter is the best time to go viewing animals because it's cold, it's not raining. And so animals congregate at water holes and riversides. And so the animals 
were out. You could see them in the winter, but it was cold. So we would get in this in the Land Rover and Stretch would cover us with wool blankets. And actually I usually took wool gloves and a wool cap to wear in those early mornings. We would drive out of camp and we'd go see animals, usually walking. And then about 10 o'clock, we would come back to camp to this huge breakfast, eggs for ways, fresh biscuits, fresh fruit, anything, jams and jellies, anything you could want. And then we napped and probably from a food coma, being food comatose or something. And then we would get up about 2.30 or three and go out for an afternoon evening safari and come back to a four course meal served by Stretch and his staff and stories and bed and it would start over the next day. So most days Stretch drove for a little while. Once we all piled in, he drove for a little while and he had a blanket over his shoulders, over his olive gray outfit uniform. And he would drive and all of a sudden he would just stop and hop out of the vehicle. There were no, there was no roof and no doors. And he'd just hop out of the vehicle and he'd walk with his blanket around him and he'd point at the road and he'd mutter and he'd look and he'd look to the side and then he'd get back in the vehicle, keep driving and then get out and do it again. And we didn't really know what was going on. Well, pretty soon he'd do this after three or four times and then he'd say, all right, let's go see some animals. And so everybody would pile out of the Land Rover and we loaded up with binoculars and water bottles and whatever else we had. And we'd go see animals. We walked single file behind Stretch. Walking is one of the best ways to see animals. We walked single file so that animals looking at us from the front saw one person stretch and weren't as threatened. We walked through the, the, the wide open spaces and the thickets called Jess. And sometimes our, during our walks, Stretch would stop and say, does anybody see the Pell's fishing owl? Now, Pell's fishing owl is the largest owl in Africa, probably in the world. It's over two feet tall. And I couldn't see it. Sometimes he would say, can you see the hyenas? They're over there under the bush getting out of the heat. And I'd look, I'd train my binoculars, I couldn't see it. And sometimes he would say, can you see the lion over there? There's a lion and it's, she's got two cubs in that thicket and she's gonna come running at us, but just stand still and she won't come this far. And I couldn't see it until the lion charged. It, so it was, it was frustrating. So I started taking the position right behind Stretch. So what I could see was Stretch's back and his gun, his safety gun, that was strapped over his back because I didn't want to miss the honey badger or the 16 foot crocodile. But I didn't generally see those either. One time we were walking single file through adrenaline grass. Now I know there's a scientific name for adrenaline grass. I don't know what it is. That's not what Stretch called it. He called it adrenaline grass as did all the other guides. And it was adrenaline grass because you didn't know what was in it and your heart was pumping so strong and so fast. The grass was about six feet tall and it hid entire herds of buffalo or warthogs or kudu or, or, or anything. You couldn't see through this stuff. So this one time I'm walking directly behind Stretch all I can see is adrenaline grass everywhere I look. And remember, Stretch is 12 feet tall. The grass is only six feet tall. He can see. So I'm walking straight behind him. And my heart is beating because I don't know what's in the grass. And then Stretch stops. And he says, do you see that? And he points very carefully with his finger. And I turned very slowly to look and I couldn't see anything. I looked where he was pointing. I looked where the other guests behind me were looking. I looked where my husband, Mark, had trained his camera and I couldn't see it. 
it was only when we got home and Mark showed me the pictures that he had taken and pointed out that there in the adrenaline grass, 15 feet right from where I was, was the black triangular nose of a lion and the tufts, the black tufts of his ears, 15 feet and I didn't see it. So I must have gotten really frustrated because the next day we were out and stretched early in the morning, got out of his vehicle, started pointing. And then he turns back to the, to the Land Rover and says, Ruthie, come, let's read the newspaper. So I got out of the vehicle and it was then that stretch started to teach me how to see, how to see in the bush. Reading the newspaper was about reading the prints in the grass and the sand. You could tell who passed by the night before, last week, the month before, even if it was muddy. He showed me how to read not just animal tracks, but the padded ones with four toes and the padded ones with three toes. He showed me that I could distinguish the droppings of an impala and a kudu. And I know now that droppings from a giraffe, you could even tell whether it was a male giraffe or a female giraffe. They look like a little bullet. And in the top of a female giraffe's dropping is a little divot. Stretch showed me that where, where I could see the depressions in the grass where zebras or warthogs had slept the night before. And now when I take my binoculars up and look at a saddlebill stork, I look at the eyes because the males have black eyes and the females have yellow. I can tell that the, where, which paths are used most by elephants because at elephant shoulder level, they're rubbed smooth, the twigs are smooth and you can touch them. I can see this from the scat of a hyena and I can tell a hyena's from a leopard's. And I can see what the hyena had for dinner, whether it was warthog or a bird. And I can look into a thicket and tell pretty well if there's anything out there that might come charging. One of the best days was when I saw a pearl spotted owl, a little tiny, it's a pygmy owl, the smallest owl. And I saw that owl before stretch and before anybody else saw it. And she was beautiful. When well, once stretch taught me to see, the bush came alive. What had been colorless and, and stayed started to come alive with movement. I could see things that were not supposed to be there, outlines, silhouettes, and I could see the animals and the birds. And I started to wonder actually what it was that I wasn't seeing in the other parts of my life because I hadn't been taught. The last time I went to see Stretch, we drove into camp and Stretch came out and picked me up and said, Ruthie, and he swung me around as he always did. And as he put me down, I saw his truck, a brand new truck. And I said, Stretch, there's a dent in your truck. What happened? And the legendary guide of Southern Africa just sort of crumpled in front of me. And with shame, he lowered his head and he said, it was Bruce. She couldn't see it. It's blue. So are we looking at Bruce? We are looking at Bruce in the uh in sort of a living hangout area um 
it was a risky shot to take, but I <laughs> we did it. You got to see Bruce. So there's Bruce. Yeah. Um, so we have a question. I have a couple questions. Um, the first is so so now you've told us countries uh, stories from several different countries um and i was wondering when you're picking stories for an event such as this one and i'm going to keep bruce on the screen while we bruce the female hippo if i understand correctly um i'm going to keep bruce on the screen while i ask when you're picking stories for events like this one how do you pick what stories you want to share well, I tell you, tonight is a really special night because I do not usually have an hour plus to tell whatever I want to tell. Um, usually I have to fit into or get to fit in with with other um, storytellers. And so I, I pick something that I haven't told before or that I have told, but not to this particular audience. Um, sometimes there's a theme. And so I pick that kind of story tonight. I sort of I. <laughs> This is the, the logical American uh, school side of me. I made a, a chart and I, um, I looked at, I made the chart that had people and places and um, events down one side. Um, and then I had uh, where in the world they happen. And I wanted to give a little bit of mix. So I, I sort of looked at where the X's were on my chart and picked the ones that, that felt good. Um, and just to let you know, um, I know Kathy asked for this story. I, I didn't tell it just because Kathy asked for it, but Kathy, I, that was for you. Um, but most of these stories tonight, I have never told in a, in a setting like this. And so you all are hearing brand new stories. Um, I do want to give a shout out and a thanks to a storytelling group that I work with on Thursdays who have heard um, the rough drafts of, of four of these stories, ones that I've never told before, and they helped me improve these stories. So that kind of coaching and, and feedback is so helpful when, when putting a story together. Um, but so two of them are, are stories that I have told in, in public and four of them are brand new stories live for you tonight. Um, my second question for you is when you're picking your stories, how do you then practice? You mentioned your, your storytelling group giving you feedback, but how, do you just tell them over and over? How do you practice your stories? Um, I usually write my stories um, or take notes, do an outline kind of thing. And then I take my outline and I go for a walk in the woods. And the bears and the squirrels and the, um, the chipmunks and all things get to hear my stories over and over and over. And I, I speak them out loud. Um, I don't do it in my head because a story is, like this is supposed to be told out loud. And so I like to be able to hear myself and I suppose the bears do too. And so that's how I practice. Um, and I carry a pencil with me and I will, I will um, mark down where it just doesn't feel right or where I feel like I need to, to reorder something um, because it just, it doesn't make sense or my my remembering the order of the story would be easier if I switch some things around. So, yeah. All right, I have an audience question. Um, so I've made you big on the screen again because this is about your background. Uh, over your shoulder, initially, uh, our audience member Mary thought it was a chair, but I've been led to believe that maybe it's not. All the way back underneath the picture on the wall, it has a face. What is that piece of furniture? And um, can you tell us why it looks so enchanting? Um, so that is a sculpture. It, it, some people would call it a mask, um, but there's no hole in the bottom of it. It's a piece of solid wood. It's very heavy and it sits, it's sitting on um, horns. Those are the feet of it. Um, and my husband, Mark, saw it in a, upside down in a in the back room of a shop one time and he said it when he saw it it even had a toilet seat sort of over its head um and but he saw it he's got a really good eye for these things and came back and told me he didn't buy it and he said um ruth i really really i love this thing it's a smiling um statue i, I want it i said well just go ahead and get it 
well, a couple of weeks later, I came home from work and that thing was in the living room staring at me and I burst into tears. It is not smiling to me. Um, and so I, it terrified me. I didn't know what to do with it. He loves it. We have these discussions with, with friends and guests who come over about, is it you know, the moment of creation? Uh, or is it somebody trying to scare off the boogeyman or something? Um, it's, it was made in, in the Congo. Um, we didn't get it in the Congo. It had been um, removed from the Congo and was being sold in a, in a market in Zimbabwe. It is sitting on, I don't know whether you can see it, it's sitting on a piece of furniture that is a granary from Afghanistan. And so my husband was posted in Afghanistan for a while and bought some, some Afghan furniture. And so that is a, is a granary that opens up, you put your grain in and then there's a little, a little hole at the bottom. So I'm glad you like that. <laughs> Um, a different, different Mary asks, um, have you ever considered publishing, uh, your stories or have you published any of your stories? I have not. And I started, um, probably about eight or 10 years ago writing, um, because I thought writing was the way that I worked in American school. That's the way I was trained. Um, and I realized there was something that missing. And what I eventually came to was my voice. And I know people say you write to find your voice, but it was literally my voice that I wanted um, to, to share a little bit of. And I did not know about this craft of oral storytelling. Um, and so it was just in the back of my mind as I kept writing. And then um, back in 2016, 15, um, I realized that I could take a class in oral storytelling and I was thrilled. And so it's been full steam ahead ever since. Um, and are all of the stories you've told tonight true? Every single one of them. Now, just so that you all understand, there's a difference between truth and fact. I want you to think about that for a moment truth and fact. And sometimes I have to say that my memory is such that I can't remember a particular fact. But I put in details maybe of a story that are true to the essence of the story or the person or, or the event. So absolutely, every single bit of them, every single bit is, is true. That's all the questions I have for this story. So I'll let you continue on. And just a quick note, thank you to the audience for bearing with us. There's been thunderstorms in Alexandria today. I think Ruth and I both had internet connectivity issues there for a second. So I'm sorry that your story was interrupted, Ruth, but thank you audience for sticking with us. So it was a Sunday, early afternoon in late January in the little tiny village of Kizilach in Southwest Turkey. Mark and I had been living there for about six months. And Sunday was chilly as like all the other Sundays, but there was something different this day. Instead of empty streets or dirt roads, there was a movement of people towards the soccer field at the far end of the village past the intersection. So we decided to put on our coats and our boots and go see what was happening. So we followed this wave of, of motorcycles and donkeys and some cars and people. There were old men in, in jackets, layers of jackets and wool caps. And there were little girls in frilly dresses. Moving in the same direction were boys in, in leather jackets and high top kind of, of, of um, shoes and women in long dresses with headscarves, many of them tied under their chins. We couldn't resist. So we followed and we ended up at what would normally be the parking lot, but there were no cars on this particular Sunday. Instead, there were carpets 
and on each carpet, dressed up with colors and wool blankets, standing with splayed back legs and haughty looks, or kneeling down and looking through four inch lashes were camels, dozens of them. Most of the camels had one or two men so somewhere lounging around grooming or, or tying things onto the camel. Some of the camels were just the prop that a man was leaning against, maybe to keep warm on the cold day. The animals were decorated and muzzled. So Mark and I moved a little bit farther. We paid our 10 lira, about $2.50 for the both of us to get into the action area. And there were more people there than I had ever seen in Kizilots at any time during that whole time we'd been living there. Hundreds of people sitting, standing, walking around, the kids were running all around this low walled dirt field. The air smelled of wild sage because people had been walking on it or sitting on it, it was crushed by, by um, folding tables that they had brought. And the air was also filled with the smell of grilling meat, sausages from the vendors, or fresh sardines on little braziers that the spectators had brought. And picnics, the picnic spreads were spectacular. Nothing simple and straightforward like a sandwich and a drink. No, folding tables were laden with hummus and white Turkish cheeses and all colors of olives and cucumber salads and full green peppers that had been pickled and tangerines and baklava and halva and breads. Oh, the Turkish breads, this, the round simits with the, with the sesame seeds and the cheesy guzleme. There was even pink cotton candy if you wanted to buy some. There were bottles of water and raka. Raka is the national drink of Turkey. It's a licorice flavored alcohol that is clear, but what you're supposed to do is pour it into a clear glass and pour cold water and it turns milky. The whole place was just energy and excitement, noise and movement and there were men with these long wooden horns who went around and for a few pennies would, would play music at your table. The children laughed and screamed and ran around and the adults talked and yelled to each other across the way and they ate and they played and it was beautiful and noisy and wild. But the main action was on the field. You see, the camels belonged to proud owners, whether those were individuals or whether those were neighborhoods, kind of like the floats at Mardi Gras. And the animals were decorated in bright colors and blankets according to each of the neighborhoods or the owners. And there were tassels in reds and oranges, and there were wool blankets and turquoises and maroons. And the wrestling animals were all male, male camels, big animals, eight, nine, 10 feet at the, at the shoulder with then their long necks and their big soft feet. And today, the special day, their fur had been fluffed up to make their necks look bigger and their ankles look wider. There were no riders. The competing camels came in from, from opposite corners onto the field and were held back by a series of ropes with, um, held by, by men who were associated with each camel. And they had neon vests. So you could, dis you could distinguish between the, camel, the camels and the team that were neon green and the team that had neon yellow, for example. And to get the, camel, the male camels going, the competition um, officials walked a female camel between the two males, and it worked everybody up into a frenzy. At the right moment, 
the ropes came off the camels, the muzzles came off the camels, and the male camels started at each other. And they tried to win by pinning the neck of the competitor on the ground. And so it was fur and spit and froth and tassels and color and dirt. For about 10 minutes, the camels swayed with their long necks and they tried to get ones down. They bit each other's lips and they bit each other's ankles to try to get the competitor to put his, his own head down to, be, to maybe have the other one pin it up and down, long necks, big feet. It was amazing. For each camel, there were these safety teams. And then there was also walking around the field veterinarians, just in case there was a camel who was bruised or damaged or bitten or stepped on, or maybe it was a person. And the matches were not very long. It's lasted in this, in this cloud of dust for about 10 minutes. And then the judges made a call and the, about who won. The judges were sitting on a flatbed truck behind a table with their raka and their picnic, which were just as important as their scorecards. And once the winner had been declared, they were off and the next competitors came in. There were no trophies for the winners, just bragging rights. They were big bragging rights for the, for the owners and the whole neighborhood. And the losers, I don't really know. But what I do know is that those camel sausages with the hot pepper sauce were awfully tasty. So tell us what we're looking at right now. Okay, so um, top left are the camels fighting. You can see how big they are. Um, they're, they're, those are two male camels there. They've got their, their colors on, on them. Um, the top right is the team or the two teams pulling the camel apart. They didn't want the camels to get too hurt. So they let them go at it for a while, kind of like a boxing match. Um, down below, you see on the right, uh, you see the, the sausages, camel sausages. And on the left, you see the, uh, the, some of those musicians. Those things, I don't know if you all know what a vuvuzela is from, from Southern Africa, but it sounded like that. It's a, it's a um, very loud, almost annoying <laughs> horn sound. Um, but that's what, that's what we're looking there at there. Um, so I believe we have one more story tonight, Ruth. Um, I don't see any audience questions for the camels, so I'm going to let you jump right in. All right. There's a chance that you might see me hugging a tree. Now, I wasn't always this way. I've liked trees. I like leaves in the shade and I like climbing them. In fact, in Bulape, I used to climb up and read up there because my little sister couldn't bother me, but not hugging them. But that changed one afternoon in my office in Harare, Zimbabwe. We were living in Zimbabwe because I was the head of an American organization that was there to help Zimbabwean organizations write policy statements about HIV AIDS. Now this is really important because at this time about one in four of every adult of reproductive age, age was infected with HIV AIDS. There was no family, church, school business that, that was not affected by HIV AIDS. And so the organizations that we worked with were, for example, the Zimbabwean um, Council of Churches, or the, the Catholic Conference of Bishops, um, or the, the National Parliament, both senators and representatives. The fav my favorite group that we worked with was the Zimbabwe National Traditional Healers Association. Yep, traditional healers. This is what we did it this way. Our organization paid for 
the gatherings all over the country, multiple gatherings of traditional healers to come together and talk about what traditional healers could and could not do, were able and were not able to do with respect to HIV AIDS. And then we brought that information together. We helped draft a policy and then we gave the policy back and did some more meetings all over the country so that they could refine these policy statements. So over several months of travel and work and drafts and, and talking with people, um, I really came to appreciate um, these, these traditional healers and what they did with their clients and for their clients. Just on an aside, their public statement said, we traditional healers know that there is no cure for HIV AIDS. And we also know that we traditional healers can, um, can help alleviate some of the symptoms of HIV AIDS and Western medic medicine can alleviate some other symptoms and we need to work together. So it was a very, it was an interesting and um, important and exciting bit of work for me. Um, I, I, just, I just loved it. A few weeks after the draft was accepted, the traditional healers decided to throw a launch of the policy. And they decided to do this in Harare, the capital, at the Sheridan Hotel. Now, the launch was a press conference. It was a bit of a, a reunion of, of traditional healers. And it was also a celebration um, all, all rolled into one. So traditional healers came from all over the country. Men and women, young and old, novices and, ex and experts came to this launch. And they came dressed in their finest celebration wear. On normal days, they looked like you and me, but for celebrations, they wore grass skirts and rope belts and African animal sashes. They decorated with feathers and bones, sticks and stones, and most of them went barefoot in the Sheridan Hotel conference room. As the head of the supporting organization, I gave a speech and then I went barefoot too. And there were drums and dancing and, and some more speeches and lots of food and songs. Several of the healers went into trances with the songs and the drumming. One of the healers came and danced right in front of me, looking directly at me. He danced and he stared and he stared deep into my soul. And he communicated with some part of me that I've never found words for. Sometimes I still feel that energy. That afternoon was one of the highlights of my time in Zimbabwe. But several weeks after that launch, my secretary back at the office called me on the phone and said there was a visitor out front and who would like to talk with me. So I said, I'd be right out. So I got up and walked down the hallway to the, to the front desk. And there was a, a woman, a plump woman with a, a magnificent quaff, caramel skin, and a fake white leather purse over her elbow, a really big white leather purse. I invited her to come down the hall to my office and we sat down at the small round table that I use for meetings. And she told me her name was Stella. Stella told me she was a traditional healer from the Huangue area of, Zaire, of um, Zimbabwe. And Stella had been out of town when we had had meetings in her area for the policy launch or development. And when we'd had the launch, she'd been out of the country and she was determined that her input would be heard and included in the policy statement. She had come 450 miles to see me to make sure this happened. So I gave her the time. In fact, it wasn't hard. She was a great conversationalist. She was very clear about what she wanted. And, and we talked for, I don't know how long, I was just having too much fun to even, even cut off the meeting. She was eloquent and, and descriptive. And she got up to go. And I walked her to the door of my office and I pointed down the hall and she took a couple of steps down the hall. And then she turned around and came back to me and said, 
may I have a few more minutes? I said, of course, come in. And she shut the door behind us. It hadn't been shut before. And Stella sat down in the seat that she had just vacated and looked at me hard. And she said some things that were not HIV related. You're some, you are someone who cares about other people a lot, but you don't show it. You need to. You have enormous energy, but it's blocked. You must unblock it. Wear yellow on Thursdays, that'll help. You are blessed. You have at least three angels behind you, protecting you and guiding you. And whatever great things you have done in your past, Ruth, they are nothing compared to what the future holds for you. And you must be strong and you must be prepared mentally and physically. And to help you in that, go to the trees. They will strengthen you. They will support you. They will renew you. And then Stella stood up to leave again and she walked out of the door and out of my life and ever since because of Stella I try to show if only just a little bit how much I care and I look for the angels and on Thursdays I see what's yellow that I might be able to wear and I spend more time with trees I swing in them, I sit under them, I talk to them and listen for their answers. And sometimes, sometimes because of Stella, I hug them. Thank you for that story. Um, this is your last opportunity tonight to ask Ruth some questions. So I'm going to let you put those questions in the chat box while I ask a couple. Uh, my first question for you, Ruth, is if our audience is interested in learning to tell oral stories like the ones you told tonight, where can they do that? Oh, this is a lucky time with, with so much on, on, on the internet and so much on Zoom. This is a really great, great time to be looking into storytelling because you frankly don't even have to leave your own, your own living room to do that. Um, there are search for, for storytelling groups in your, in your community by state or by city. Um, you'll, you'll find something and call those people up, ask them questions, whether, see, see if anybody's running, um, running workshops or something. You don't though have to be somewhere close by that's running a workshop. Um, the Storytelling Association, I think it is of, of Indiana, for example, um, runs some wonderful storytelling workshops and swaps. A swap is a time where you come together and casually informally tell stories. And sometimes if you want, you can get feedback on, on those stories. Um, the Virginia Storytelling Alliance, which is the, the group here in Virginia, that is um, the sort of trade association, if you want to talk about, about it in that way, or, or just the group of people who like to tell stories. Um, we are having a, uh, a gathering is the name of our annual meeting. I, we are having a gathering at the beginning of June. And so um, during that gathering, there will be times um, to listen to stories, workshops on how to tell stories um, and coaching. So if you already have a story that's a little bit um, half-baked and you'd like someone to help you solidify it and, and make it more, um, more presentable, uh, check that out. And I think, I think Hannah has put that information into the, into the, uh, the chat for you. So check that out. Yes, we have links to both the Virginia Storytelling Alliance and to um, the storytelling classes and workshops that Ruth was speaking of. Um, I'd also like to ask, we have a question from Nancy. Nancy writes, have you ever done events with storytellers from other countries? Do you think there are common elements across oral storytelling traditions across diverse cultural contexts? 
I think so. I mean, stories are, well, let me just put it this way. Our brains, regardless of what culture you grew up in, regardless of what language you speak, our brains are designed for story. We're neurologically wired for story. So you can tell stories across cultures um, and, and get the same impact. Don't try telling jokes or funny stories. Sometimes that, that doesn't translate so well. Um, but, but stories themselves and the, the, the craft of storytelling is, is one that is very familiar to many different cultures. I mean, I've, to, I've told stories here tonight about being in Africa. There's so many people who grew up in those oral storytelling traditions. Um, they have it more than we do. Um, we all tell stories around the table at Thanksgiving, for example. They tell stories all the time. Um, and so working with folks from other cultures, I have found um, humbling because they are, they can, they can get the ideas faster. And um, one of the groups that I've been working with is, is a group of um, fellows called the Mandela Washington Fellows, who are um, business people, advocates, um, non-governmental organization folks all over Africa. And I've helped put together a storytelling workshop to get them to sort of remember how to use stories in their work. Um, and not just at home, not just outside the doors of, the, of business, but inside. And I've run a workshop with them. I am getting ready to, to do some coaching with sort of the winners. And then in a couple of weeks, we will run a special Zoom session for those folks to tell the stories about what sparked them in their journeys towards, towards the, the passionate work that they're doing. And that's so much fun. I just love doing that. Uh, Lynn asks, do you ever tell stories as part of your interactions with clients or partners in the course of your work? Absolutely, all the time. <laughs> and it may not be quite as formalized as what I've told here, um, but I, I tell, I, so it might be called an anecdote, for example, um, but there's a, a story for a purpose. And so that is, that is one of the, the things I do tell. Um, I have taught at, the, at one of the lifelong learning um, communities here in, in Charlottesville. And one of the, it was about Africa. And one of the things I was talking about was African art. And I wanted to, to show not just tangible art, like this, the, uh, the thing in the back behind me, but also intangible art. And intangible arts are the arts of storytelling and dance and music and things that can't, can't be captured and touched that way. Um, and so in order to introduce that, I wrote and came up with and told a new story about dance. So my, my participants and, and students in that saw with their mind's eye intangible art, the dance. And they also heard with their ears the intangible art of storytelling. So I use it, I use it a lot, yeah. Um, Mary asks, what are some good resources for learning stories to tell specifically for children? Um, I would go to your librarian. And um, your librarians are, are folks who say, well, just like Hannah, um, folks who say, um, who can say, look, we're looking for stories for six-year-olds, six and seven-year-olds or something. And, and you can decide whether you want to tell a story that the kids might be familiar with or a personal story. Um, and I, I don't usually tell stories for children. And so I'm not real familiar with that, but, but um, if it's the Mary I'm thinking about, you too know about librarians and um, are one. And so folks like, like um, Mary and Mary Lou and, and Hannah can, can help you figure that out. As I said tonight, this, or we sort of advertise, this is storytelling for adults. Um, there is storytelling for children. Um, there's all kinds of storytelling. I mean, the historical storytelling, there's, there's a whole group of folks who compete in liars contests. And the winners are the ones who have told a lie better than anybody else. And so, I mean, all kinds of stories are out there. Um, and so whether it's children's stories or fairy tales or, or, or things that there are resources, just search online, how to tell a fairy tale, um, that kind of thing. 
So. My last question for you tonight, Ruth, is where can we hear more of your stories? <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you want to. Um, I have nothing on the calendar right now. This is my last storytelling event for the year so far. Um, it has been a, an interesting year because I've done a couple of uh, the past six or eight months. Um, I've done Zoom tellings. And it's, I tell you, it's hard sometimes to tell a story um, when I can't see an audience. I, I get a lot of energy off of seeing your faces and seeing your reactions, um, even seeing when you're bored and looking off in the other direction. I, I, I can feel that. I don't even, my husband's not even here tonight. So I'm in a space all by myself. Um, and it's a little bit challenging. I have, I have asked Anna, um, Hannah to stay on the screen the whole night. So she has been my audience tonight. Um, but this is the um, this is the the one the last event I have. Of, if you're interested, this is going to be recorded, and you can watch all these again. Um, but but I don't have anything currently planned. And if you are if you're somebody I know and who has my email address, um, let me know if you're interested, and I'll put you on sort of my uh, notice give notice if I'm if I'm doing another telling. So thanks. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Our four part stories from friends series will conclude on Monday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Our last storyteller is going to be Cheryl Mason. Um, as Ruth alluded to, this event was recorded and will be on our library YouTube page, which I've also put a link to in the chat box. Um, part one with Joyce Morgan Young is already on the YouTube channel, ready for you to watch. And part two with Solvay Eggerts will be posted tomorrow morning. So um, all of these, all four events will eventually make its way onto our YouTube page. You can also find other great stories. Sarah Brady is a local performer and she did some stories for Women's History Month. Um, and Sheila Arnold is an excellent performer and she's done several things for us, which we also have on the YouTube page. So check out some of our past programs as well. You might find some new stories that you're excited to, to listen to. Um, I just want to thank the audience for uh, for coming out with us tonight on a random rainy stormy Tuesday night for some stories. And I want to thank the Duncan Foundation for sponsoring our all Alexandria reads program I did technically make this part of our all Alexandria reads program so get out there read some books and thank you to the Duncan Foundation. Um, any last words for our audience Ruth before we end for the night. Um, yeah, one last thing. Remember, you are a storyteller. So don't be shy. Go out and tell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Good night. <laughs>